Our second lesson is from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church in Thessalonica. I'm reading from chapter 5, beginning with verse 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. My brothers and sisters, this is the living word from our living God. Let us all say, thanks be to God. And will you pray with me? We receive your word with joy, O oh God. Even in the midst of difficult circumstances, we know that you love us, and that we can trust that you are working in the world. Speak us, speak to us now, your words of hope and joy. Amen. Some time ago, there was an article in the New York Times which featured an interview with a security guard who has witnessed the Christmas tree lighting ceremony in Rockefeller, Rockefeller Plaza for the past 20 years. He noted how the expressions on the faces of the people changed when the tree was lit. The people appeared happier, more at peace. At first he wondered if this was just his imagination, but after 20 years he was certain. When the tree was lit, the people were transported and their joy could be seen on their faces. Today we are celebrating the third Sunday in Advent. It is called Dote, Goteye, which means Latin in, uh, which means rejoice in Latin. The theme of joy and rejoicing is picked up in both Isaiah passage and in Paul's letter to Thessalonica. The prophet Isaiah identifies God as the joy of my soul and celebrates the fact that he has been sent as an emissary of joy. And then the Apostle Paul's message to the church is similarly joyful as he encourages them to make rejoicing a habit. Paul says rejoice always, regardless of your circumstances. To rejoice in the midst of adversity is always a challenge. But I suspect it's even more difficult for many of us these days. It is not a coincidence that Advent comes at the very darkest time of the year. But now we're struggling with the darkness of a global pandemic, a country divided, illness and suffering, economic woes, anxiety, grief and tragedy and job loss. Many of us feel that brooding emptiness and alarming anxiety about our future. And into the darkness, God speaks. God speaks to us a word of light and joy. In spite of everything we're facing, Advent can be a time of joyful hope. Perhaps part of the reason we have trouble experiencing hopeful joy right now has to do with our understanding of joy. Too often we equate happiness with joy, and they are not necessarily the same. Charlie Brown once said to his friend uh, uh, Linus, what do you want to be when you grow up? And Linus replies, I want to be outrageously happy. Well, that's only in a cartoon world, Linus. When you live in the real world, you discover 
that it is not possible to be outrageously happy all the time. I'm certainly not happy to be leading worship with this face all black and yellow and blue, but I've decided to be joyful during this Advent season just the same. Joy is not found in worldly, external, contrived festivity. William Stringfellow tells of having an engaging conversation with a young man at a Christmas party and learning that it was his 17th party in two weeks. Stringfellow said that poor guy looked like a zombie because he was so worn out from his madcap effort to find joy in the season. In the midst of yet another surge of COVID-19 cases, surely this Christmas's celebrations are going to look very different from last year's. But as Paul reminds us, we can discover joy even in the most difficult circumstances. How and where we look for joy is key. There's a wonderful legend from the oral history of one of North America's indigenous tribes. A little known tribe from the foothills of the Rocky Mountains was notorious for attacking neighboring tribes and engaging them in fierce battles. With little regard for their great spirit, they neglected their religion and had no charity for their neighbors. Finally, one of the old chiefs called together a few of the least wicked, wicked braves and held a council to discuss what could be done to save their tribe from themselves. After many passes of the peace pipe, the wise old chief decided the only thing to do <clears throat> was to take the secret of joy and peace away from those who were abusing it and hide it where no one would be likely to find it. The big question was, where should they hide it? One of the braves suggested they bury the secret of joy and peace deep in the earth. But the chief objected. No, that will never do, he said, for some of these evil ones will dig down deep into the earth and find it. Another brave thought it would be wise to sink the secret of joy and peace into the dark depths of the ocean. Again, the chief replied, no, not there, for someone will learn how to dive into the ocean's deepest depths and will find it. Still another brave thought the secret should be taken to the top of the earth's highest mountain and be hidden there. For a third time, the wise old chief objected and said, no, for someone will eventually learn to climb even the highest of mountains and find it again and keep it for themselves. Finally, the wise chief suggested this solution. Here is what we shall do with the secret of joy and peace, he explained. We will hide it deep inside the heart of every human being. They will never think to look for it there. And according to the old tribal legend, to this day, humans continue to run through to and fro all over the earth, digging and diving and climbing, searching for something the Great Spirit has already placed in the heart of each of them. Both the prophet Isaiah and the apostle Paul spoke of a joy that was found within them through the love of Christ and was not based on circumstances. There is the joy we are, that is the joy we are talking about today and was probably the kind of joy seen on the faces of those watching the lighting of the Christmas tree in Rockefeller Plaza. On this third Sunday of Advent, we seek to discover or rediscover the joy 
within us. Now I want to point to the obvious truth. Our experience of Christian joy does not deny the presence of real hardships and real suffering in this earthly life, nor are we naive enough to presume that if we only believe and trust enough, then as a reward, God will protect us from hardship and suffering. We know that God doesn't work that way. The kind of rejoicing the Bible talks about is a rejoicing that goes on in spite of disappointment and hardship and pain. For instance, did you know, scholars suggest the prophet Isaiah most likely delivered those beautiful words, that uplifting message, while standing among the ruins of Jerusalem. The long exile had ended. The Hebrews had returned home to discover nothing but devastation and ruin. It was in that setting of dark despair that Isaiah shared his joyful words of hope. And when we consider the life of the Apostle Paul, we should note that much of his life was marked by adversity and suffering. He was shipwrecked and nearly drowned. He was arrested numerous times and thrown into prison for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He suffered with health and age issues, and yet through it all, Paul encourages Christians to be joyful at all times. Author Amy Tan wrote one of my favorite books called The Joy Luck Club. It's an oldie, but it's a goodie. She tells of a group of Chinese women who have been brutalized and horrified by the atrocities of the Japanese invasion in the 1930s and 40s. And I warn you that these words are very disturbing. disturbing. These women asked, how much can you wish for a warm coat that hangs in the closet of a house that burned down with your mother and father in it? How long can you see in your mind arms and legs hanging from telephone poles and starving dogs running down the street with half-chewed hands dangling from their mouths? Such chaos created terror in those ladies' hearts. However, they determined that they had a choice to make. They could either sit and contemplate such horrors with somber faces, or, as they put it, they could choose their own happiness. These four women organized a club. They met once a week over the best meal they could prepare. They played mahjong and told stories that made them laugh to death as they put it. They chose to laugh at the absurdity and ambiguity of the world. They made their own luck in the midst of the disaster of war, and they named their weekly parties the Joy Luck Club. These women knew something of the joy within which gave them the courage to rise above tragedy their story confirms for us that our God does come into our darkness, and that assurance can bring us a sense of inner peace and joy. I would add this truth. As we discover the joy within us, we can also be assured that God has the power to transform our darkness you see, the coming of Christ 2,000 years ago was evidence of God's desire to transform our darkness into glorious light in the midst of fear and isolation and grief and anxiety and illness. God can bring light and joy into our lives. The late Reverend Rod Wilmoth tells this story written by an American columnist who, because of travel glitches, had to spend a Christmas Eve 
with his wife in Paris instead of coming home for Christmas. He wrote, everything had gone wrong when we checked into our hotel on Christmas Eve. There was no Christmas spirit in our hearts. It was raining and cold when we went out to eat. We found a drab little restaurant shoddily decorated for the holiday. Only five tables were occupied. There were two German couples, two French families, and an American sailor by himself. In the corner, a piano listlessly played Christmas music. I was too tired and miserable to leave. I noticed that the other customers were eating in stony silence. The only person who seemed happy was the American sailor. While eating, he was writing a letter, and a half smile lighted his face. At the table with the French family on our left, the father slapped one of his children for some minor infraction, and the boy began to cry. And then on our right, the German wife began berating her husband. All of this was interrupted by an unpleasant blast of cold air. Through the front door came an old flower woman. She wore a dripping, battered overcoat and shuffled in on wet, run-down shoes. She went from one table to the other. Flowers, monsieur, only one franc. No one bought any. Wearily, she sat down at the table between the sailor and us. To the waiter, she said, a bowl of soup. I haven't sold a flower all day. To the piano player, she said hoarsely, can you imagine Joseph soup on Christmas Eve? And he pointed to the tipping plate, which was empty. The young sailor finished his meal and got up to leave. Putting on his coat, he walked over to the flower woman's table. Happy Christmas, he said, smiling, and picking up two corsages. How much are they? Two francs, monsieur, monsieur. Pressing one of the small corsages flat, he put it into the letter he had written, then handed the woman a 20 franc note. I don't have change, monsieur, she said. I'll have to get some from the waiter. No, ma'am, said the sailor, leaning over and kissing the ancient cheek. He said, this is my Christmas present to you. And then he came to me, the writer. May I have permission to present these flowers to your beautiful daughter, he asked. In one quick motion, he gave my wife the corsage, wished us a Merry Christmas, and departed. Everyone had stopped eating. Everyone had been watching the sailor. Everyone was silent. But a few seconds later, Christmas exploded throughout the restaurant. My friends, we rejoice today not only because God breaks into our darkness, but because we can also trust that God can transform it. In the midst of these dark times, I wonder, will you make room in your heart for God's gift of joy and peace? Let us all look within to discover or to rediscover the joy God has placed within our hearts. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Amen.